Farewell to Manzanar, Chapter 19, Reentry. A few days before we left Manzanar, Papa decided that since we had to go, we might as well leave in style and by our own volition. He broke free of the lethargy that had nailed him to our steps for months. He grabbed his Bismarck walking stick and took off, almost at a run, heading for Lone Pine to buy himself a car. Mama tried to talk him out of this. Traveling by bus made much more sense, she said. It was faster and we'd be there in a day. He snorted with disdain at her advice. Before the war, he had always preferred offbeat, unpredictable cars that no one else of his acquaintance would be likely to own. For a couple years, he drove a long six-cylinder Chrysler that got about nine miles to the gallon. In the early 30s, he drove a terraplane. Late that afternoon, he came back from Lone Pine in a midnight blue Nash sedan, fondling the short stubby gear shift that projected from its dashboard. The gear shift was what attracted him, and it was one of the few parts of that car to reach Southern California unscathed. To get all nine of us, plus our clothes and the odds and ends of furniture we'd accumulated from Owens Valley, 225 miles south to Long Beach, Papa had to make the trip three times. He pushed the car so hard it broke down about every hundred miles or so. In all, it took four days. I went in the first load with Mama and May and a back seat heaped to the ceiling with dishes and lamps and bedding. A double mattress was tied to the roof. We could have been an Oki family heading west, while Papa, in his wide brimmed hat and turtleneck sweater, drove like a wild man, as if he couldn't wait to get back to civilization. I didn't understand this. After all the stories we'd heard, each time the car collapsed, I prayed we might be stranded there indefinitely. But he could leap out, cursing, and bully it into motion again, fix the tire, replace the fan belt, kick the radiator, whatever was required. I still see him standing by that desert road in the hot shade of a great saguaro cactus, the blue hood open as he shouts at the engine in Japanese, damning it and damning the man who sold him this car. He slams the hood shut in disgust, ready to attack it with the butt end of his cane. And that slam, as if by insult, somehow starts the car. So that Papa has to jump in and grab the steering wheel and get that dashboard gear knob before the Nash drives away without him. When he came back from Lone Pine, he was drunk on the first real whiskey he had tasted in years. He was drinking all the way past Mojave and into the northern suburbs of Los Angeles. There, he suddenly sobered up and his mood began to match what mine had been since we drove out of the main gate, as if what we all had been dreading so long was finally to appear at any moment without warning. A burst of machine gun fire or a row of Burma shave signs saying, Japs, go back where you came from. The stories, the murmurs, the headlines of the last few months had imprinted in my mind the word hate. I had heard my sisters say, why do they hate us? I heard mama say with lonesome resignation, I don't understand all this hate, hate in the world. It was a bleak and awful sounding word. Yet, I had no idea at all what shape it might take if ever I confronted it. I saw it as a dark, amorphous cloud that would descend from above and enclose us forever. As we entered Los Angeles, I sat huddled in the back seat, silent, fearing any word I uttered might bring it to life. But there was no sign of it anywhere. In fact, no response to us at all as we drove down the palm-lined boulevards past the busy rows of shops and markets, the lawns and driveways of quiet residential streets. Leaving in 1942, no one had any idea what to expect since no one knew what awaited us. We had been underprepared and that just deepened the shock of what we found. Now the situation was reversed. In our isolated world, we had overprepared for shows of abuse. If anything, what greeted us was indifference. Indeed, if the movements of this city were an indication, the very existence of Manzanar and all it had stood for might be in doubt. The land we drove away from three and a half years earlier had not altered a bit. Here we were like fleeing refugees, trekking in from some ruined zone of war. And yet on our six hour drive south, we seemed to have passed through a time machine. As if in March of 1942, one had lifted his foot to take a step set it down in October of 1945, and was expected to just keep on walking with all intervening time erased. In the months to come, because one did have to keep on walking, 
one desperately wanted to believe nothing had changed during those years of suspended animation. But of course, as we soon discovered, everything had. Our most immediate problem was where to live. What Papa had read in the papers was true. Housing was short and getting shorter. During 1944, over a million people had moved into California from the South and Midwest. But due to wartime priorities, very little new housing had been developed. Now, 60,000 Japanese Americans were returning to their former communities on the West Coast and being put into trailer camps. Quonset huts, back rooms of private homes, church social halls, anywhere they could fit. We were luckier than many. The American Friends Service, the same people who had helped us after the eviction from Terminal Island, helped us rent and move into an, apart an apartment in Cabrillo Homes, a housing project in West Long Beach, built by the government for shipyard and defense plant workers. At the time, it seemed to be a big step up in the world. There would be no more standing in chow lines. Now, Mama had a stove to cook on. We had three bedrooms and we had an inside toilet. As soon as the front door was closed, Papa went in and flushed it. And when it worked, we all hooted with delight. I didn't really see Cabrillo Homes for what it was until I started high school a few years later. It looked like a half-finished and under-maintained army base. Long, two-story stucco buildings were set in rows like barracks. Peeling, two-by-four banisters guided you up the outside stairways. Community clotheslines ran above the ragged strips of grass. Mama picked up the kitchenware and some silver she had restored with the neighbors in Boyle Heights. But the warehouse where she'd stored the rest had been unaccountably robbed of furniture, appliances, and most of those silver anniversary gifts. Papa already knew the car he'd put money on before Pearl Harbor had been repossessed. And as he suspected, no record of his fishing boats remained. This put him right back where he'd been in 1904, arriving in a new land and starting over from economic zero. It was another stip, strip of the castrator's scissors, and he never really recovered from this, either financially or spiritually. Yet neither did he entirely give up. One of the amazing things about America is the way it can both undermine you and keep you believing in your own possibilities, pumping you with hope. To maintain some hold on his self-esteem, Papa began to pursue his doomed plan for setting up a housing cooperative among the returning Japanese. In our small front room, he built a drafting table and worked on sketches for what would become the thick pile of blueprints he carried to households and civic offices all over Los Angeles County looking for support. Mama's first concern, meanwhile, as always, was how to keep money coming in. She had saved about $500, but that wouldn't last long. Soon after we settled into Cabrillo, Cabrillo Homes, the Friends Service found some openings at one of the fish canneries, and she went back to the kind of job she had when we lived on Terminal Island. It meant much more now to her than it had before the war. In 1941, after Papa disappeared, she was, mar she was marking time while we drifted, awaiting the inevitable. Now, she knew the household income was going to be her responsibility for quite a while. Papa would never accept anything like a cannery job. And if he did, Mama's shame would be even greater than his. This would be a sure sign that we had hit rock bottom. So she went to work with as much pride as she could muster. Early each morning, she would make up her face. She would fix her hair, cover it with a flimsy net, put on a clean white cannery worker's dress, and stick a brightly colored handkerchief in a lapel pocket. The carpool horn would honk and she would rush out to join four other Japanese women who had fixed their hair that morning, applied the vanishing cream, and sported freshly ironed hankies. As for me, the shapeless dread of that great dark cloud in my imagination gradually receded, soothed away by a sky the same blue as it had always been, lawns the same green, traffic signals that still changed with dependable regularity, and familiar radio programs to fill up the late afternoons and evenings. Jack Armstrong, Captain Midnight, The Whistler, I Love a Mystery. That dread was gone, but those premonitions proved correct in a way I hadn't been at all prepared for. On the first day back in public school, when the shape of what I truly had to deal with appeared to me for the first time. <laughs>